I'm really excited about today's message. I, I got to tell you, you're lucky that I'm going to forget most of what I studied because this could be like weeks long. All right, this is really a battleground passage, and I've been excited to get into it since we began the book of James. And this sets up an idea in, inside James 2, in the latter half of the chapter, of faith versus works. Now, you can see here that I've got Paul and James kind of posing off. And this is an idea that some people have, that this passage is opposed to what we learn from Paul. And I hope that you remember how we are saved. It's one of the most central questions to any belief system. How are you saved? Right? I hope, I hope even that many of you can remember and even go to a passage like this. Ephesians 2.8 For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. And i got to explain grace. We use that word grace sometimes, and maybe we don't really think about what it means. It's not mercy. It's much better than mercy. Mercy isn't getting what you deserve. Mercy is when they catch uh, someone who is a criminal, and they don't kill them on the spot. You know, maybe in war, mercy, mercy. They don't kill them. They spare them. That's mercy. You know, grace is getting much more than that. Uh, when I was in Calvary Fellowship, um, Calvary Union Fellowship in Ohio, there was a police officer, a former police officer, who would sit kind of in the back, and I would tease whenever I would describe what grace was, because I, I couldn't help but make a police officer joke and kind of poke at him, because he was a friend and he would poke and joke as well. But I would say that mercy is like if when Tim was a police officer, that was his name, and he pulled you over, and he didn't give you a ticket, even though you were clearly speeding. Grace is if Tim signed his name on a card and handed it to you and told you that if you take it to your favorite or his favorite donut shop, you could have free donuts for life. And he'd go, oh, you know, Sam, why, why would you do that? You know, and, and it would bother him a little bit, but it would demonstrate how absurd and silly grace in some ways seems. Because I wouldn't, if my kid did something terrible, if my kid punched a hole through our TV, I wouldn't take him out and go, you know what? I love you so much, I'll buy you a car. You know, it would be a little bit a little bizarre, but grace is like that. It's undeserved, totally well above and beyond what we should get. We actually should be paying for our sins. And if we aren't paying for our sins, or if we are not counting on Jesus as giving us His grace and His payment, and we're trying to pay ourselves, then we're in trouble because we could never pay that back. My son doesn't have a job. He couldn't pay the cost of a TV, right? We are often, and we, we make the mistake of changing this around, we are often the bad guy in the story, not the good guy. We're not the hero in Scripture. We are the one who needs rescued Right? We're not the hero who comes in and saves the day with our own works. And if we were, if any part of that was to do with us, then we could boast and talk about our part. Right? Even if we weren't Batman and we were Robin, we could still go, well, at least I did my Robin things. At least I was a sidekick. We're not even the sidekick. We are the damsel in distress. We are the bride who's rescued. And if we did have some credit, we could boast and we could compare, we could brag. Romans 3.28 continues. Maybe you think of this verse when you think about uh, salvation. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. I want you to note that word justified. It's going to be a key word as we go through, as we look at the passage that we're going to spend most of our time in, in James. Here it's used in what we would say is a theological sense. This is the way that this word is often used. It is used to mean you are made righteous, you are redeemed. It is kind of a legal position. In God's eyes, your debt of sin, your sin debt, it's all paid and you're good. It's justified. And we recognize Romans 3.28. This is part of the Romans road. It's part of the book of Romans, which has been called the constitution of the faith. That is, if Paul was writing his doctoral dissertation, then he would, this is Romans. That's what that would be. Uh, this tells us so much about the faith. And here it says it has nothing to do with what we could add to it. It's perfectly in line with what is recorded in the Old Testament in Isaiah that says our righteousness is but filthy rags. And I know I bring this up often, uh, and I'm sorry for the grotesque picture, but the word actually is used minstrel rags. So sometimes the Bible records things in a more graphic manner than I think we want to translate it in English. It's really disgusting. And that, that was the idea. Our best is really disgusting because our best could never make the cut. 
And later on in Romans, he records, Paul writes, But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. Undeserved undeserved merit is a translation of grace. It's a little clunky language-wise. But undeserved favor or a blessing or a good thing that you definitely don't deserve if you're doing something to earn it, or even if you're doing something to maintain it, then it, it becomes potentially deserved instead of undeserved, right? It's like saying a square circle or a married bachelor. Those are concepts that don't make sense. And Paul continues with that idea. And yet, we see some people that teach a very different thing, even people that would say they have the true teachings of Christ, right? You know that uh, we've talked about this before, Mormons have a very work-based gospel, right? And so we've talked about some of my interactions with Mormons before. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses have a very works-based gospel. They'll use some of the same terms, but they'll use something like this. Imagine you're in a very dark pit in a hole, and then Jesus lowers down a ladder. Those of you who are here, you can see that, you know, maybe uh, you can see that that ladder's actually bolted in to the cavern there. But it's lowered in, and suddenly you have a way out. And Jesus provided that way out, but you have to climb the ladder. Well, that analogy is very faulty, even though they'll use something like that. Because if I count on my own power to get out of there, well, I might slip, I might fall, I might mean anything. But also, it assumes that I want to get out of there. I think if we're really honest with ourselves, a lot of us, before we were saved, And even after we're saved, we find ourselves attracted to sinful things. Rather than go out in the sunshine, we'd probably rather stay in the dirt sometimes and play with ants or bugs that we found, okay? It sounds silly, but that's really what we would do rather than do what we are commanded to do and made to do. But here they would use something like this, and it puts you as an active participant. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, there's another, another way of saying this, that maybe Jesus comes down in and he picks you up, and he scoops you up. Now, somebody who deals with um, picking up somebody if they're drowning, uh, a lifeguard, they'll know that sometimes people will kick back. I'm not talking about accepting that Jesus is helping you or grabbing onto a rope and Jesus pulling you up. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about in this analogy, and this is one used by Mormons, it involves work to get out there and work to stay out there. And it isn't just them. Even inside Christianity, um, and I say inside Christianity, there's obviously some serious doctrinal differences and flaws. And I think as a whole, uh, the Catholic Church has issues that, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to blanketly endorse the whole Catholic Church as Christians. But I have met individuals inside the Catholic Church who would disagree with their own doctrine, who I do believe are brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, and, and one of those, you know, I, I was a dear friend at Ole Miss. But the Catholic Church, in response to the Protestants reading James and understanding it in context, proper context, and then going forward and having a big role in the Protestant Reformation, they had what's called the Council of Trent. And they said this, If anyone saith that by faith alone the impious is justified, sounds a lot like Ephesians 2, 8, 9 to me, in in such a way, or in such wise as to mean, sorry, I started like automatically translating that into modern English, in such wise as to mean that nothing else is required to cooperate in order to the obtaining the grace of justification, and that is not in any way necessary, that he be prepared and disposed by the movement of his own will, so his own will, he's got to be doing something, let him be anathema, damned. Now, I actually took this. This is an image from the documentary American Gospel. It's on Netflix now. I've watched about 40 minutes of it so far. I think there's like two hours left. So far, I'd really recommend it to you. There's, there's one thing that I think if you, you don't provide some context, I was like, oh, I hope that they provide context. And then the next clip that they showed, they provided some context. And I was like, Phew, okay, good. You explained your comment there. But I mean, it, it's been so far really wonderful. They really explain salvation and I really enjoy it. And it's very rare that there's something actually of merit on Netflix or anything like that. So it, w- it was good to see that it was there. But they were helpful and they circled anathema. Right? That's a different word that we use. It's not an English word, and it's translated here, damned, and that is correct. Damned is not just a cuss word. Okay? It is a strong form of cursed, specifically cursed by God and kept away separately forever. 
Paul at one point says, if it were possible, I would be damned if it meant that my countrymen could be saved. But that's not how it works. We each have to accept or reject Christ. He's calling out to us. Right? It's on an individual basis. We can't ride on anyone else's coattails. We can't go, I'll give you my ticket to heaven and I'll take your place in hell. That doesn't work. The only person who's going to be able to pay for our sins and who did pay for our sins is Jesus. And we can count on Him or we can count on ourselves. And if we count on ourselves, the work that we produce is not going to be enough. But a Catholic person would say, hold on, you, you sola fide people. Uh, and by the way, not all the Protestants even like James. Martin Luther had issues with James. I don't have time to go into that today, but we're not Lutherans either, right? So we don't trust any of the individual Protestant reformers to become the new pope either. But the, this is supposedly unchangeable official Catholic doctrine you have to agree with to be saved. And so anybody who, the Protestants who believe by grace alone, we're, we're automatically, we're damned, we're out. Other people, they've kind of wiggled away in. The Pope has said, well, even if you're an atheist, but you're a good person, you might get in. Uh, all, the person who isn't going to get in, the Protestants who believe what the Bible says. <laughs> so they would go, wait a minute, you sola fide person, you grace person. You're ignoring James 2. And then they would read James 2. And I want you to understand the tension here. So I'm not going to point out a lot. I'm going to read through it. And then just on a surface level reading, kind of out of context, definitely out of context, I, I think you can kind of see their point, but we got to dig deeper than that. James 2.14 says, What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed, and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. But someone may well say, You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. It's actually a reference to the Shema from Deuteronomy 6 that the Jewish people would, would uh, say every day. You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But you, will, you are willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless. I stumbled there. Let me reread that. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works. And as a result of the works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. And there was a key phrase there. In the same way, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead." So on a surface level, it sounds like we really do have a, an issue. Paul is disagreeing with James. And we see this sometimes in, inside commentaries or attacks on the church. We'll see atheists claim this way. Like, see, there's different bands of Christians. They didn't even get along. I encountered that from somebody I went in high school with. That's not what's actually going on. Okay, And we're going to look at Acts in just a minute. But if that's what's going on, we have a bigger problem. A Catholic may share this with you, or somebody who believes in work-based salvation may share this with you. But if they do, they've not won their position. They've not, in fact, proven that, oh yes, we need to work for our salvation. What they have proven is, we can't trust the Bible, because then there's a hard contradiction, if that's what is truly meant by James. But let's look at some context here. Right? Let's look at Acts 15, and this is Peter speaking, but James is present, Paul is present. By the way, if, if I know I'm picking on Catholics today, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm not really sorry. You guys know that sorry, not sorry, like hashtag? Okay, sorry. Sorry, not sorry. Um, if Peter was really the first pope, why is it that James is the pastor who's overseeing this kind of council? This is the first church council. And he's the one hearing kind of Peter and Paul and everybody else talk. And by the way, Peter and Paul, they're on the same side here. It's other people that are on the opposing side. 
Now therefore, why do you put God to the test by placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? Okay, I, gotta, I know another scripture verse is up there. Here, let me go back. Let's just pause right here. What's that yoke? What is the yoke there? I hope you know the answer. It's the Old Testament law. It's the, not just the general sense that all, all God's creatures should obey certain commandments, but in the specific covenantal relationship with Israel that if you do this, I will bless you. And, and the idea, too, that you do these things to be saved. That's how you become righteous as you fulfill the law. And that's what the Pharisees were teaching. The Sadducees, they were sad, you see, because they didn't believe in an afterlife. That's how we explain that to kids. And the Pharisees aren't fair, you see, because they're hypocrites. They tell you to do one thing and do another. But the Pharisees, they were telling this. The Sadducees were basically telling this. They were only focused on the rewards in this life. But both were really teaching, if you do great things, God will give you great stuff. And then God becomes this kind of a the Japanese word is gashapon, and I can't believe I forgot the English word for it. You put, the, um, you put a coin in, and you turn it, and then you get a little toy out. And so it's one of those little turn tile things, or maybe bubble gum, something like that. And, and you, you do those kinds of things, and it's what it becomes with God. If you do the right things, X, Y, and Z, then you get this back from God. And that's what that becomes. But they're saying, we are not going to put some kind of unapproachable yoke on people that they can never accomplish. Just back in James 1, remember that context, he talked about looking at things in a mirror. You do not, if you look at yourself in a mirror and you notice your faith is covered in filth, you don't take the mirror off the wall and try to scrape that filth off of your face. What do you do? You go for water. You go for living water if it's spiritual filth. You go for the refreshing living water of Jesus and he cleanses you, right? And if it's just broccoli in your teeth, you get some floss. But you don't use the mirror. The mirror is a tool, not the object by which you cleanse yourself. It just reflects that you need cleansed. So that's still James and James 1. So it doesn't match with James 2 if James 2 means you have to work for your salvation. So Peter is talking here, and he continues on, but we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they also are. So if, if Catholics think this is their first pope, then they've got a problem because then that, this pope contradicts other popes and you've got, you got an issue. Therefore, it is my judgment that we do not trouble those who are turning to God from among the Gentiles. Now, I skipped a couple of verses, and this is James now talking. James is setting, and he's listened to Peter and Paul. He's listened to people that would become known as Judaizers that say, yeah, Jesus saves you, but you also have to do this other stuff to stay saved. You also need to be circumcised. You also need to keep certain dates and feasts and all this other stuff. And eh. No, that's not it. That's not what saves us. And so James is, ag is agreeing with Peter and Paul here. And then he continues, but that we write to them that they abstain from things contaminated by idols and from fornication and from what is strangled and from blood. For Moses from ancient generations has in every city those who preach him since he is read in the synagogues every Sabbath. So he is saying, no, they don't have to follow the law, but here are some guidelines. And he doesn't give them, hey, follow the Old Testament. He gives what's actually called the Noahide laws again. These are general rules that Noah got for all of humanity that God expects, not just from Israel, but for everybody. Life, blood is a symbol of life. So I do not believe that we can eat blood pudding. I don't believe we morally should. Not a salvation issue, but I believe we're commanded not to, right? And why would you want to? But if, if you did, I would advise against that. But in general, it's also connected to these people, they're going to be living in context with Jewish people, and they need to ha have some commonality with them. And so they're going to do these basic things, not for salvation, but for effectual communication of the gospel with others and loving obedience. And so James doesn't say anything. In fact, there's no verse that says, if you follow X, Y, Z, then you are saved. If you accomplish X, Y, Z, you are saved. In that kind of sense. It's not like that. You don't do a certain work to get saved. Now, we respond, and that is consistent elsewhere, we respond to our salvation with something. We are saved not just from our sins, but we are saved to something, to a walk with Jesus, transforming of the renewing of our mind. And as we focus on Him, 
we naturally respond and become different as we fulfill the purpose we were made to fulfill, which is to know God and make Him known. So let's look at James again, James 2.14, with this context in mind that this is the same James who didn't put the Old Testament law in front of people. He didn't list a big long works for salvation purposes, but did say, yes, there are things that you should do. And this is the same James that said and agreed with Peter and Paul that we are saved by grace. So let's go in and look at James 2.14. What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but he has no works? Can that faith save him? I hope you caught that. I'm going to underline it. That faith. What's James dealing with here? James is dealing with the same kind of stuff that we're dealing with. Remember, who's he writing to? He's writing to a mostly Jewish church at this point, out who's been scattered abroad as they've received Christ. And they've gone out and either scattered by persecution, they've left Jerusalem, or they came to Jerusalem for a feast, received the gospel there, and then left. And then they've got these new little church, new little churches, new little Bible studies and home churches and plants, all these places everywhere. And he's writing to those people who are already assembled, assembling as believers. He's not writing a Bible tract on how you get saved. And he's saying, what if you encounter somebody who says they're a Christian and then doesn't live like that, right? That kind of idea. They say that they have faith, but then they're different, right? Someone says he has faith, but he has no works. He's not doing anything with that faith. Can that faith save him? Uh, On either side, you'll see a younger me with more hair up top and some glasses, and you'll see another person who was out as a missionary, and then that gentleman in the middle, they got saved that day. This is many years ago when Avery Joe was really, really small, and we were out with Judean missions, and we got paired up, and we went out on the streets of Louisville. Oh, um, the event was Thunder Over the River or Thunder Over Louisville, something like that, and they would have fireworks, and they would have a, a race with boats, and they'd have all these things, and there was all kinds of people traveling and hanging out downtown, and so Judean missions, they started uh, going there every year, and they still do. If I've not been able to go, sometimes I've actually helped support somebody to go. And they go, and they go out on the street after training people on how to evangelize and witness. And they go out, and they find people that are kind of walking around the street, and then they just talk to them. They pray with them. They ask them questions, things like that. And then the goal is to lead them to Christ. Now, I know street evangelism might not be your gift, but it is some people's. Uh, Mike Rasmussen was in the first service. That would be hit, one of the things that he loves to do, and I appreciate that. And I, I got to tell you, some people have told me that that was my gift. I don't think they know what they're talking about. That was not my gift. I'm nervous every time I do something like that. But you go out and you do so in obedience, and you just do it. Not this time, but years later in New Orleans, I would talk to a Muslim who was over here learning how to fly planes whose name was Jihad. And I was like, well, praise God. I, make sure that this man leaves with the Bible, you know, and we got to talk to him. So that kind of ministry is important, even if it's not our norm organic outreach ministry. But I share this because this trip blew my mind. Uh, I don't think it was that building right there, but we were standing in front of a building for a lot of the time in front of a Methodist church in town. And as we would ask people if they knew Jesus, the answer very often would be, I've been baptized or I'm a church member. Not, yes, I know Jesus. He is my Lord and Savior. Not, Jesus is good. You know, Jesus saved me. Nothing like that. Uh, In fact, one person in front of that church says, I was baptized in this church. When's the last time you bid? Well, when I was baptized. When were you baptized? I don't know. I think I was like two or three. I don't remember it, but I'm good. I don't need Jesus anymore. I got him. And so we would encounter these kinds of things, and they were inoculated from the gospel in a sense because they thought they were already saved. But when we asked them what they were saved from, they couldn't answer. They didn't understand. My daughter, she was with, while we were in a cabin, which, by the way, love love that we actually, like the, the only the second time since we've had kids that we really got to go away without the kids. And so Avery Joe's seven. So imagine how little this happens, okay? So I praise God for that little rest. We got to go away to a cabin. She's in the van with, my, uh, with her cousins, my nieces, and then also with her, 
her grandma, my mother-in-law, and they're driving and they go see a a matinee movie theater together and they pass a church that has a cross on the side of the road. And my little girl at four years old could explain the gospel. She says, that's a cross. Jesus died on one of those. He died there to pay for our sins. Our sins are when we do things that we shouldn't do that are wrong, like lying. And now, because he did that, we can go to heaven when we die. Four years old, she's got it. Little evangelist, love it. You know, I'm I'm tearing up a little bit right now, like, oh, those times they're coloring or they're kicking each other or whatever. They are listening, you know, praise God. Some of that gets through. And so she got it. That's the gospel. Well, we would ask them, nah, I'm good. And, And so that was heartbreaking. This guy realized, hey, wait a minute. I don't know exactly what you're talking about. We prayed with him. He got saved. Right Now, we kept in touch for just a little bit, but that's been years ago. I've lost touch with both of these people, and, and I haven't been on a Judean mission in many years because I moved out of that area. But I'll never forget this idea, well, my name is on a roll, or I've done this thing, and then therefore I'm saved. Not, Jesus paid for my sins, things that I intentionally done wrong. He is my Lord and my Savior. And if He's my Savior, I want Him to be my Lord, and I want to do what He says. No, nothing like that. So let's, let's go, let's continue in James. He's talking about people like that who say that they're Christians and they're, they're going to encounter this in an early fellowship. We do that now, but then live like the world. And when I say live like the world, I mean when the world says something's okay that's contrary to Scripture, these people will say it's okay. And I'm not talking about, man, they might look a little funky. They might wear Hawaiian shirts to church or, or whatever. I'm not talking about them having tattoos. I'm talking about their minds and their behavior. Okay? They're conforming to the world with the way they believe, what they value, what they lift up, and what they covet, and by co- they pursue instead of pursuing Christ. Now, let's be honest. We have encountered people like that. We have encountered people, they support this and they call themselves Christians? What? You know, we talked about that recently. How could that be? Well, this is talking about that. If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed, and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Now, that's a pretty blunt comment, and that's why I love James, and we might return to this later, because some prayers need to have more than just words behind them. If God has equipped you and you are able to help people, simply saying, I pray for you, and then not getting up and helping them, is it very much. If there's, you know, I lived in Kentucky where where things got cold, actually. They don't really get cold here. You think it gets cold here, it doesn't. Kentucky even really doesn't get that that cold. But I can recall someone who told the church they needed, you know, please pray for me, I need firewood. You know, I need to figure that out. Well, you know what somebody did? They went and chopped, yeah, they prayed for him, but they also went and chopped up some wood and brought them firewood. And that was an answer to prayer. That was very practical. We need to do those things. But that's not the main point James is making here. That's kind of a side point. The main point James is making here is, what do you do with somebody who says, oh, I'm a Christian, I love people, I pray all the time, and yet, man, they're mean and they're selfish and they don't actually, they don't actually help anybody else. There's no interaction with other people. They're not serving. If they're supposed to be Christ-like and Christ came as a servant— they don't seem very Christ-like because they're not being a servant. That's what he's talking about here. Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. Fast forward to the end of this chapter. What does he compare it to? He compares it to a body, okay? So keep that in mind. But someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works and I will show you my faith by my works. He's setting up this dichotomy by two, about two people that both say they're Christians. How do you see which is the authentic one who's actually following Christ? And he, he challenges, he's about to challenge what we would call mere mental assent or agreement. You believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. So demons know that there's a God. Just believing in God is not the same thing as being a Christian. Right? Having faith is not the same thing as going, Jesus was real. And, ha- and people. There was Anthony Flew. He, he became a monotheist. He was the Richard Dawkins of his day, a noted author who was an atheist who attacked the faith. He engaged with people who loved apologetics like myself. 
uh, although only these people were a lot, lot smarter than I am, and they were able to make some convincing arguments. And he goes, you know what? You convinced me that there is a God. Still not sure who he is. And then unfortunately he got sick and died. He wasn't saved. Just by recognizing that there is a God there doesn't mean that you actually have a relationship with him. Faith, faith, biblical faith means an active continual, okay, if active is confusing, a continual trust based on evidence, based on what you know. So faith is not just, I recognize that a plane and a pilot exists. Biblical faith is, I trust that pilot and that plane to get me to my destination and actually climbing aboard it. And that whole journey, you are exercising faith in that plane and that pilot. And I've shared with you many times that my kids enjoy flying, and as they go up, they say, my daughter says, oh, we're going up, we're going up. One time we hit some pretty bad turbulence, and she screams, we're going down, we're going down, we're going down. And everyone else was a little nervous. But still yet, we have faith in that pilot to get us there. So it's not mere mental assent. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Now, you know I use the NASB. I love the NASB. Uh, it's, it's translated at college level, unlike some other modern translations. It translates modern into modern language. Sometimes language changes. It uses a broader selection of old, uh, old manuscripts to make sure that it is as accurate as possible to the original. And, but I, and I, I really love it. But they actually did a pretty bad job translating this verse. And I think King James does it a little bit better. Uh, the word foolish here, it can mean empty in the Greek. And I get what they're saying in the NASB. They're trying to go, well, you're empty-headed, so you're foolish. I get that. But I think empty is, is a better translation because they're not spirit-filled. They're not connected. So they're empty. And this is that faith without works is useless. And here, useless, that that. Greek word can mean dead, and I think King James actually gets that right. You empty fellow, faith without works is dead. And because he's, this whole time he's using a comparison to a body. Now think about it. I have, I've never been a paramedic, right? But I did get some basic little uh, training on how to check some vitals and things like that when I was a JJO in Alaska. That's a juvenile justice officer. Because even though I didn't have the training to do that, that was the wild frontier. And so occasionally we'd give out medication, take temperatures or do whatever. And even though I didn't have a psychology degree, I was also doing anger management training and all this stuff. You can do lots of things without a degree in Alaska. So if you're desperate for a job, let me know. I can hook you up possibly. It will require a move though. Um, wonderful job. But I did do some of those basic things. And so when I was checking somebody's vitals, those vitals themselves, if I was to take this little machine and put a pressure cuff on somebody or stick that little thermometer in their mouth. Uh, the vitals themselves aren't what makes somebody alive. Their symptoms are their secondary things that demonstrate that the person is alive. And so we can use them to measure, hey, you've got a pulse. You're alive. You're really alive. You're not just a dead corpse. And what are we before we get saved, right? We're dead to our sins. Well, this person who says they have faith, if they have no works, it appears they're still dead to their sins. There's no vital signs. There's no life there. It's continuing on. And this is going to be a passage that if you don't understand who James is and you don't read carefully, you might come away with the wrong idea. James 2.21, Was not Abraham our father justified? There's that word again, but I have to ask you, I'm jumping ahead of myself, but what does that word mean here? Do all words have the same meaning at all times when they're used? Right? Is it uniform? No. Some things are not univocal. They don't always mean the same thing. Sometimes they are equivocal. They could mean one or more things, and context determines it. Okay, so was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac his son on the altar? By the way, tangent, got to cover it. God was not wanting child sacrifice, okay? That was not the idea. Elsewhere it says it never entered into his mind which is a bit of anthropomorphism, but he's trying to say, I never want this from you people. The whole point is that Isaac was a monogonest, that means one of a kind, one of a kind son, and Abraham was tasked with giving his one of a kind son. Abraham, Hebrews tells us, knew that even if he died, that he could be raised from, again, from the dead because God already promised that through Isaac, and he's a grown man at this point, through Isaac, that there would be a line of descendants that would be numerous. 
So the idea was that Isaac was coming back down. You can even read, and he says, we'll be back down the mountain. Okay? So he's not going to kill him. But the idea is God takes him up there. You've got to take up something special and one of a kind and the most precious in all the world. And then as Abraham's willing to do it, God says, no, no, no. I will provide. I will provide my only son. I will provide my most precious. You can't do it. We can't do it. We cannot possibly save ourselves. And so he provided a ram, but it was all just a picture for him providing Jesus later. And so was Abraham not, uh, was by our father, he says, you see that faith was working with his, I'm sorry, was not Abraham our father justified? So he says, our father, talking to Jewish people, they know their Jewish scripture, justified by works when he offered up Isaac his son on the altar. You see that faith was working with his works. And as a result of the work, faith was perfected. And that word uh, is best understood as we understand the context of the whole thing. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see, the man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Well, hold on. Here's some key context. Scripture is very important to understand. What did the author of Hebrews say about, about Abraham? Hebrews says, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. By faith. Right? Not by works here. And he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. There's that monogonese word, which is a cool word. Because yes, there was Ishmael, but he was one of a kind, Isaac was. Because Ishmael was not appropriate. He was a child born out of appropriate wedlock. And so we see here was faith that Abraham even went up there to do this because he trusted God. Well, let's, let's back up. And there was a reference inside of James, but this is about seven chapters prior to the actual offering of Isaac. And this is uh, some 20 at least years because that word that's used for, for Isaac is unmarried male. It's not like a kid, so he's not a kid, but he, he seems to be of adult age. So in Genesis 15, 6, he's told, Abraham is told about the promise of Isaac. And it says, then he believed in the Lord and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. So you see here, this is way back here, he was saved then. That's when he was theologically justified. That's when he trusted God for what he was saying he was going to do. And so it was reckoned to him, or he was justified as righteous at that point. That's very important to know. So James is not going to disagree with Genesis. James is not going to agree, disagree with his contemporary author, who's the author of Hebrews. We don't know who that is. James actually is mentioned as one of the candidates sometimes. We don't know who that is, though. Uh, he's not going to disagree with that. They know their Jewish theology. They even know that this Genesis 15, 6 is when Abraham was saved, and then later on was something different, even though that word justified is used. We can see this word justified used in Luke seven twenty nine in a particular way. When all the people and the tax collectors heard this, they, and then you'll notice that little, little mark there, that A. I hope when you're reading your Bibles and you see something like that, you read the little notes at the bottom. I almost went with a different translation for this verse and for another verse, but I thought it was a great opportunity to just pause and talk about this. This verse tells you like, maybe another possible translation or more, little tran- more literal translation. They're using acknowledged here, and I get why they're using it. Because they're affirming that something is true, and so that's acknowledged. But the word here is, and I'm going to butcher this because I'm not a Greek scholar here, dikeo. And that word is the same word in James for justified. So they dikeo, they justified God's justice, having been baptized with the baptism of John. Now, no one if a Catholic and I were to debate, which I've done that before in front of some people, that was fun. I wonder if I get to do that again. That'd be, that'd be great. But and they were to bring me to James, and they were going to say, this word James here uses DKAO. It has to mean that works justified them. I would take them here to Luke 7.29. Because they're not going to claim that these tax collectors, who at the time, you know, we don't like the IRS now, 
But they really didn't like them because they were seen as traitors for working for Rome. So they would have been seen as the outcasts and the bad guys. They were definitely not going to claim that these outcasts, these bad folks and sinners, that they somehow made God righteous. But that's the way some people want to use justified in James 2. Remember, these things were not written in English. And sometimes we get bad doctrine because we over and are over literally take an English word and the English translation and think it means a certain thing without actually looking at the Hebrew and Greek. The translations might have some issues in them. No translation is perfect because language is hard to translate. It's the originals, the Hebrew, the Aramaic, and the Greek that we believe are inspired word of God, the inspired word of God. And so James is using this word in the same way that Luke is using it. Acknowledged it, recognized it, or maybe you could say proves it or bears it out. So when all the people and the tax collectors heard this, Jesus is he's doing miracles. He's, he's at this point, he's sharing and teaching. They acknowledge, they recognize, you know, God is just. God is just. So continuing on, keeping that in mind, let's read James 2.25. In the same way, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? James is not saying Rahab wasn't saved until that point. No, what James is saying, was not Rahab the harlot also proven to really believe in God by works, by what she did? In other words, she proved it. She believed that the God of the Hebrew people was the real God. So as these spies came in who were going to destroy the city, you know, and she said, I'm on your side. Yeah, you're on our side? Well, first off, you're, you're kind of in an immoral business. Second off, uh, we're trying to destroy your city. Are you just trying to trap us here and lure us in so that, you know, you catch us off guard? No, no, no. I'll prove to you that I'm on my side. I'll lower you out through the window. I'll hide you. So her actions proved that her faith was genuine and real, and then they could trust her, and she was eventually spared. See, it perfectly is in line with the text. But if you say that it's justified the other way, that her work saved her, well, then you have James and Hebrews disagreeing. You have James and Paul disagreeing, and then you have Scripture not being trustworthy. This is the only way that could make sense. And considering we know James's character, we already know that he was being countercultural and recognizing that No, the law couldn't save you, only Jesus could. This is what makes sense to what James is saying. For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. There is his carry-through line that he's been using throughout. He's saying it's like the vitals. If you want to see if somebody really has faith, there's going to be a changed life. Their vitals are going to show it. It's not going to be something that is just... uh, Oh yeah, I have faith, and then there's no change whatsoever. And then they go out and live like the world. If they are living like the world, and they're agreeing with the world, and they're going the ways of the world, then maybe that's really where they are. They're really worldly. And I'm not saying that in, you know, in a superficial sense. I'm not saying that we as Christians, uh, we're going to be perfect all the time. There is no, there is no chance that we're going to live a perfect holy life. We need a Savior every single day. And I'm not encouraging you to feel guilty. I think sometimes when we encounter this, especially here in America with the prosperity, health and wealth stuff, they'll do things like, oh, works are so important, and one of your good works could be sending us $500 and we'll pray over you. They catch people in this trap, and they make them feel pressured and guilty. I grew up in an area where, you know, even the non-denominational churches were Southern Baptists. That's the joke. But there were a few Pentecostal churches in the area, and I had some very Pentecostal friends, and some of them were fine, but a couple of them, they were always in the cycle of getting saved. They were never living in Jesus' grace. They didn't love their salvation. They weren't thankful to God that he spared them, that he, his son died for them. The, every week they were re-getting saved because they were all just confessing their sins and they were just running on this treadmill. They weren't growing deeper in their knowledge of the word and worshiping God with their mind. They were just terrified. And that's what a faith that if you believe faith plus work saves you, that's what the end result is. And in fact, a lot of people just give up. If it takes my works to continue this, then there's no way I can do it. I might as well just go wild. And that's what my wife 
well, she didn't go that wild. But in college, she grew up with a system, growing up Mormon, that said you, know, you need faith plus works. And so at some point she said, I've done enough that God couldn't possibly love me, so I might as well go do what I want. Now, thankfully, she encountered some Christian friends before me and then eventually encountered me, and, and, and she eventually got saved. And we, I got to be the one that baptized her. I don't know if you guys knew that, but that was really cool. But it, that's very different when you're resting in His grace rather than counting on what you can do. The pressure in some way is off. But then you respond differently. You respond with thankfulness. So is it this? No, 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 no. It is not just climbing out of a hole. Or it is not, you know, participating in this way. It is not, I have to keep moving. I have to keep myself saved. If it depends on me to keep myself saved, then I'm in trouble. No, it's more like this. It's more like God has pulled you out of that deep hole. And then you look back and you go, wow. God, you carried me for that long? You love me so much you went that down deep and that dark of a place to rescue me? There's an old country song that says, God must have reached way below the bottom of the barrel that day for me. And I, I, I'm not going to sing it. First off, country isn't my thing. And second off, you wouldn't want me to sing. But I think of that song when I think about this. When you see that and you go, wow, God rescued me from the pit of my own sin that I got myself in. Then you respond, by God, I love you. I want to live for you. I want to know more about you. I want to worship you. John 14, 15 says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. A faith plus works person, man, that's a threat. If their worldview is right, that is a threat. If you really love me, you will do everything I say. Maybe you had a parent like that. But our Heavenly Father, you see, we teach our son and our daughter the word agape. And there have been times when he's been in trouble and I've had to say, now, do you remember what agape means? It means you love me even though I'm in trouble. <laughs> and he'll, you know, he'll be a little dejected and a little down, but he gets it because it means my love for you can never change. It's never going to increase or decrease. No matter what you do, you're, my love for you is not dependent on what you do. I will love you regardless. I may punish you because I love you, but I love you and you can't make me not love you. And that's agape. And so if, if we take the biblical view, this is, if you love me, you want to keep. You will keep my commandments is a promise, not a threat. It becomes, I'm saved to something, not made to do something, not out of fear, but I want to. I want to follow you, Jesus. Because see, faith and grace, they work together like this. I'm sorry, Tropicana, I stole your logo. Um, grace is what saves us, and faith is that access point that we have to gain access to that grace. It is not a work in and of itself. No, that's not a work. In fact, Jesus at one point, hey, you want to work? Believe. So he's kind of playing it off as, you know, that's, that's a work. No, it's not. Uh, it's grace. It's all what God has done, and we can access that by trusting in him. And then that takes the pressure off, and that can change us, and He can mold us. No longer do we have to try to clean a fish before we catch it. We can let Jesus transform us from the inside out. And we're going to want to follow a God who saves us like that. Because it isn't faith plus works equals salvation. They got it all backwards. They rearranged this. It's faith, the saving biblical kind, equals salvation plus works if we truly know what God has done for us. If we know how much he's forgiven us for, then it's going to be so much easier to forgive somebody else when they do us wrong. If we truly know how much God cares for the least of these and we see the least of these, then we're going to care for those least of these. It's going to change us because we're going to be reflecting the Savior whom we love.